I just had problems at home, you know, finding out of the sore throat. Couldn't come from America. That is it. Me and our kid are sweet. In a little over three years, two brothers from Manchester, Noel and Liam Gallagher, have risen from total obscurity to rock superstar and with Oasis. Not since the Beatles has a British band achieved such phenomenal worldwide success, or so many loyal fans. Oasis have done more for Manchester than any government, uh, any local council, any feel-good factor, any football team, any campaign. Um, they've created the buzz back in Manchester even bigger than it was in 1989 and we can't thank them enough and that is from a Red um, who doesn't support City, who doesn't like any of their influences um, but I still have to say that Oasis have done an awful lot for this city and we should be eternally grateful for them. I think Oasis is all, um, one of the best bands of the generation, I think they're a really super band. I think it's even played twice, you know and they're a really good live band. What I believe is if they actually got Oasis as a sponsor on the shirt, they'd sell millions of shirts, they'll get a lot bigger city. I all met Liam once. That was brilliant. And everyone was really jealous. And uh, yeah, we were talking for about two hours on a train because I went to sit with him in the uh, first class. <laughs> it was brilliant. And he brought me a drink. No, he brought me two drinks. And uh, gave me some of his Kit Kat like a lot of 40s and 50s people, you know, aged people like it who are into ISIS. I mean, that's really, that's, that's really good and quite special, I think, you know, for bands to have such a you know, wide effect on a lot of people and age. I think they're wasting their money on drugs and drink, um, which, fair enough, might be quite good for a while, but at the end of the day, it's not going to make them last. I think they'll end up killing themselves, um, and it'll be a shame because it'd be good if there'd be another album but they'll probably die before they make it, so there you go. The most talked about rock band on the planet hit the headlines as much for the Gallagher's behaviour as their music. The Scally attitude is something that's been brought over from Belfast and from Dublin. It's, it's a, an Irish street attitude that's been imported into London and into Manchester and has been bred through generations. It's just basically, I'm bigger than you, I'll, I can have you and then I can go if you think you're hard enough. And that's fine. Everyone from Manchester just loves them just because they're from Manchester. Apparently tourism's gone up and everyone goes to Burnage and then gets there and says, uh, there's nothing here. <laughs> an ordinary working class area of Manchester Burnage is an unlikely mecca for the latest generation of rock pilgrims. But apart from the modest council house where their mum, Peggy Gallagher, still lives, there is really nothing else to see in Burnage. The second eldest of three brothers, Noel Gallagher was born on the 29th of May 1967. Liam, seven years later, on the 21st of September 1972, in Longsight, Manchester. Their parents, Peggy and Tommy Gallagher, moved to Burnage soon after the birth of Liam. It was not a happy marriage. Both Noel and Liam attended the St Bernard's Primary School behind St Bernard's Roman Catholic Church on Burnage Lane. They received their secondary education at the Barlow Roman Catholic High School in East Didsbury, where Peggy worked as a dinner lady. The lads had an unremarkable academic career with both boys leaving school with no qualifications. Their whole childhood was devoted to football, following Manchester City Football Club and hating United. There were scally lads who would never change. Every Manchester City programme that you buy, there's always a picture of the Gallagher brothers in them. Apparently Ryan Giggs, I don't know if it's true, it's just what I read about him trying to get uh, tickets for the concert and the after match party and they just told him to piss off and whether like, that's true and no no but... it's trendy to support Manchester City isn't it? Yeah. At the moment. I, I mean hate I... Manchester United. Yeah. 
they keep going on about how much they love Manchester City as well, and yeah. I won't mind them pumping some money into the club, yeah. even if it's only a couple of hundred thousand. During one teenage kickabout session in Airwood Park, Liam and Noel met Tony McCarroll, Paul Bonehead Arthurs, and Paul Gwigsy McGuigan, the original lineup of Oasis. Local kids often picked and ate the magic mushrooms that grew everywhere on Airwood Park's football pitches. <laughs> Lads football drugs. The only things missing were the beer, the sex and the rock and roll. It wasn't long before the Gallagher brothers began looking beyond Burnage and into the city centre. By 1983, Tommy Gallagher had gone, and the family were enjoying happier times. Finally, Noel began teaching himself to play Beatles songs on a guitar he had bought before he left school. Liam got into music several years later. He would use the same records as Noel before him, but Liam decided to sing along. By then, Noel had already left home and moved into a flat in India House in the city centre. They never practised together. Both brothers went to the same Stone Roses gig in 1988. It would affect both brothers' lives. Liam was so awestruck by singer Ian Brown's performance, he made up his mind there and then that he was going to be a singer. The same night, Noel met Clint Boone of the Inspiral Carpets. After being turned down as their lead singer, he joined the Inspirals as a roadie. In three years, Noel travelled the world as the Inspirals pursued rock and roll success. It's, it's a funny thing, Manchester, because there's always been this, this sort of notion that Manchester bands are innovative, and, and they're not really. It's only like the top few that have been, and they sort of set, and, and all the rest tend to copy. And it was a bit weird at the time, because there was a lot of people you went, and they all looked like Ian Brown, everyone looked like Ian Brown, and Liam Gallagher looked like Ian Brown, and still does, I suppose. And um, they sounded like the Smiths, only, only badly played Johnny Marr. Yeah, I think that, that idea of Manchester bands as innovators is, is, is an important point, and it's the obvious bands, like the Joy, Divi Joy Division and then Joy Division mutating into New Order, and the way they took on a kind of... They presented a new kind of... Uh, a vision for pop which was very very Mancunian but also drew on a lot of other stuff from outside of Manchester and from dance music and the gay scene and a lot of a lot of different influences and packages it up in something that was very new and, and an individual. The, the legacy goes back to, to Buscocks, The Fall, Joy Division, New Order, right through. I mean these are the bands that are sort of like uh, the cutting edge or these Manchester people tend to think they are or think they were. And, and so the Manchester thing was, was mainly the Mondays and the Roses at the top with the in spiral carpets. Um, and it was a dance rock crossover, really. And it's the first time that it happened in, in Britain, I think, to such a degree. I would pitch Happy Mondays as the first sort of people who, who would bring Manchester. And what they did, they were clubbers rather than gig goers, they weren't rock people. And they sort of started going to the Hacienda and to rock venues and making the DJs play house music. And then that's, that's where it began, really. And it's more exciting than rock, really. And people like Stone Roses were just like totally out of the window, nobody wanted to know at all because they were an old fashioned rock band. So, I mean, I mean, the Manchester thing grew out of dance and the whole, the whole city sort of grew from that and became, for a while, the world centre. And it was, it was quite unbearable, really. There'd been this great surge of enthusiasm to kind of sign anything up for Manchester that moved. And then it, and then it all kind of. It didn't work out, it all dissipated, it all kind of uh, fizzled away and there was a real sense of that the local scene wasn't really that vibrant, wasn't really that many great bands knocking about and there was, there was quite a sense of um, cynicism I think really about what was going to be the next thing that, that people were going to latch into and particularly a cynicism about um, guitar music. Factory imploded within about three months from, from being right at the top to, to everything going wrong the market collapsing and everything went wrong and all, all fell through and there was a sense of foreboding across Manchester and then this gun thing, um, and the drug wars and the gun thing was taken and, and, it, and people hadn't noticed that in Manchester until that point, it had been building for several years and because the world's press were there and you know, it, all, it all took place in the spotlight. In 1991 Liam joined local band The Rain with drummer Tony McCarroll and guitarists Bonehead and Gwigsey. 
Noah was stunned by the news of Liam's musical ambitions. He was far from impressed when he saw the rain play at the boardwalk in August, a universally shared opinion. In late 1991, the rain changed its name to Oasis. Not long after, Noah was sacked by the Inspirals and decided to put his songs and years of musical perseverance to work for himself. He made Oasis an offer they couldn't refuse. It was fairly dull stuff, I think, and I saw him playing once. Um, I thought it was at the boardwalk, but someone told me it was at the gallery, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't remember Liam at all. Though, you know, I've been told since that it was definitely him singing. He was a very dull singer, fronting a very dull Manchester band, from what I can gather. Um, another one of a hundred Manchester bands who sounded like, you know, a bad version of the Smiths, really. I can remember that one of the times I did see him, because he played regularly, was Liam on stage, being completely confident, sort of like you knew he was going to do something. I didn't think they were, I never thought for a million years they'd be as big as they are now, but when Noel, when Noel joined and they got a lot more professional, they were rehearsing, they were even rehearsing on Saturdays. They used to wait for us to come in at six o'clock Saturday tea time and they'd be sat in their cars waiting for us to unlock so they could come in and rehearse. And they got a lot keener then. And then you thought, yeah, well, they've got, um, they've got it there that they want to be, they want to succeed. And you knew that if they had that kind of um, temperament, they would do it. I think he did. I think he worked on this throughout his time with the Inspirals and learned from them. And they got to quite a high level, uh, sort of disproportionately high level, really, playing GMEX and things. So, so he was there, exposed to it at uh, you know, this mass audience. And he saw a band evolve very quickly and, and sort of disintegrate as well, I suppose. So he learned from that. And I think that he had the band in his head, really. And if it hadn't have been the rain, and his brother hadn't have been in it, he would have picked him another band and they would have been come by Oasis or something very similar. I do think Noel is the cause, you know, there's little doubt about that. So I think he had that sorted out, yeah. I don't know, I don't know what the inside politics were. You read a lot about it, but we got the impression where is it to do it my way or I'm not doing it at all. Off off Noel. I mean that may be not, not what it was, but when we've seen them from their attitude to change from rehearsing, it was like, right, this is my game plan and it's my game. And this, these are the rules. That's how I would have interpreted that. Well, they were very good musicians, I mean, at that stage. They had been playing quite a while, so they did, they did suit. I mean, that's another one. That's another uh, unlikely instance that the first band he should bump into that his brother happens to you know, be a singer in should be perfect for him. But, uh, but they were. I like the cover version of the Come On Feel The Noise. Um, I think it's Wonderwall. That's Champagne Supernova. It, it sort of lifts you up, makes you feel better. I think uh, Don't Look Back on Anger is my favourite tune, because we're actually trying to get that going for like our pub set somewhere. <laughs> it's just uplifting, I can't explain why. Maybe, because I really want to know, and I want to put my face on. Columbia. It's just the best one. Round our way, they did a cracking version on the Jules Holland programme. She's electric. And Daisy's dinner, because they're sort of the same, short and funny. And Wonderwall is just so well written. He must have known when Noel wrote that that he'd written the classic. Whatever is just a song that is simple, but it, it just seems to sum up so many basic sort of ideas, you know. Supersonic is really upbeat, so we really like that one. I'm mad for it. Of all Manchester's music venues, the Boardwalk has the longest reputation for promoting new local bands. Thousands have squeezed themselves onto its beer-stained stage to play. For many years, it was the city's most influential live music arena. Some of the bands that I have booked, that I did book a lot, that I think probably 
contributed to A&R people coming seeing them with the charlatans. I, used to, I actually used to book those on ticket deals, same as Oasis, Verve, those kind of bands. They all played their first gigs here. Um, I knew Verve vaguely anyway because um, they're from Wigan and I actually come from just outside of Wigan anyway, so I used to book those bands and the charlatans basically because they were, even though they were from Northwich, they were classed as a local band, so they used to play quite regularly. Situated in the basement below the boardwalk's main stage were four very basic rehearsal rooms, one of them already occupied by the Happy Mondays. What normally happens is these bands turn up, then say, oh, I believe you've got rehearsal space, um, have you got any room, can, uh, can we have, a, you know, have some space there? It was here that the boys started to rehearse six days a week in preparation for their full frontal assault on the rock universe. Well, um, they got on with the band that they rehearsed, rehearsed in here with because they knew them. Um, the other bands, there was a bit, I mean, if you look on the front of the rehearsal room door, there's, wait, it was around the time when United were winning the championship and um, the United fans in the rehearsal rooms got put posters on, well, it was newspaper cuttings on the rehearsal room door saying it was about, um, mm -hmm. they'd gone, I think United had gone 16 points clear and there was a scribbling on the front door saying Manchester United supporters club, contact Noel, apply within. So that was their idea of a joke. Well, these lot were a nuisance. They used to, um, we had to put, you probably heard the story, um, that we had to put a curfew on Liam because he used to um, smoke weed in the club and he was allowed to rehearse from 12 o'clock noon, 12 noon to 8 o'clock. When the club opened, he had to leave. He wasn't allowed in. And the day we gave him the letter, we, we summoned him up to the office, gave him the letter. Next minute, all the band are knocking on the door. Um, I think it was Bonehead that came in first, saying, uh, this isn't fair, you've banned us. And we said, no, no, we haven't. We've not banned you. The band aren't, like, banned. It's the, we've put a curfew on Liam. He can't come in because he's not behaving himself. And they said, oh, that's all right then, and went out because they were happy because we hadn't, we hadn't put a curfew on them. And it was just Liam. And then he came, he came in on uh, Boxing Day, uh, Christmas just gone, and I didn't have the heart to tell him he was still barred. Bought him a drink and he was quite happy. A couple of weeks before Christmas 91, the band received their first real review in the Manchester Evening News pop column, The Word. Reviewer Chris Sharrett, now editor of City Life, gave the Oasis demo tape a lukewarm reception. For many bands, it's like the first, it's the first time you can actually get any press because your you demo is your first kind of statement to the world. And it was, I think at the time, uh, possibly City Life, I think City Life and maybe the Manchester Evening News were the only two publications which were actually covering that sort of stuff seriously and giving it some kind of uh, proper analysis. So I think it was important, it was kind of, but that's obviously why bands sent, send them in because it's like they want to get some feedback. They want to get, obviously they want to get the good review and a lot of them didn't get, didn't get the good review. But, um, but yeah, I think, for a band starting out, it's very important because it, it was the, very much the first, the first stop, the first place to get your name in, in print, to get some recognition. That, that demo review that I, which apparently was one of the first pieces of press that Oasis got, at the time it wasn't, it wasn't like it was something that, wow, this is this is a great new band, this is the future of rock and roll. Nothing of the sort. I mean, I remember the last, the last thing I said about it. The last line was something like, um, interesting, but I'm not too excited. I mean, I wasn't. It wasn't like you know, wow, this is great, must go and ring up everyone and tell them that uh, there's this great new band knocking about. Because it, it wasn't like that. I, th I thought it was OK, to be quite honest. It, I remember seeing Oasis live and thinking, yeah, they're quite, this good singer's quite, he's quite interesting, there's something interesting there, but, you know, a band like that, they've got a guitarist who's bald, there's no way they're ever going to be big. You know what I mean? It was like that sense of, you were sort of looking at every element of the band to see, well, is this going to work? Is it going to be right? So I'd be lying, I would never want to, try and claim that I was the person who thought this is a band that are going to be massive because I didn't think that at all. The combination of Noel's songs, Liam's voice, intensive rehearsal, commitment and total belief in the band's destiny resulted in Oasis going through an incredible development over a few short months. So armed only with their instruments and their trademark scally arrogance, they headed off to over their 20th gig at King Tut's Wawa Hut in Glasgow. The legend is that 
I think they were supporting 18 wheeler, or wheeler 18 as Tony Blair would have it. Because I don't think they were booked in to be the support slot, but they, they kind of allegedly threatened criminal damage to the property and to the owner of the place if they weren't allowed to do their thing. And so apparently they, they let them. Alan McGee, the boss of Creation Records, took one look at Oasis, jumped on stage, offered them a seven gazillion pound contract. Uh, but there's, there's a rumour doing the rounds in the, in the music industry at the moment that, that didn't happen at all. In fact, there are some rumours suggest he wasn't anywhere near the place. I mean, those things don't happen in real life, do they? happen in Rock Follies or, or some sort of parody on TV, but you don't, you just don't get a record contract like that. And, you know, it, it doesn't work, but, but, but it did. After we'd seen them with, um, with Noel, I wasn't surprised because they did get quite professional about it. They got, well, they got serious about it anyway. So I hadn't seen them. If I hadn't seen them in that middle period, I would have been very surprised. I'd have thought, yeah, how, how the heck have they got that good? <laughs> yeah. Well, we did like a little, uh, what we call an advance. We've got a section called advance, and we did a little piece in there. But, you know, they were, they were on the cover before you knew it. Noel met ex-Smith's guitarist, Johnny Marr, after Marr's brother played him the Oasis demo tape. They struck up an immediate friendship. Johnny even gave Noel the guitar he played on the Smiths' classic album, The Queen Is Dead, a rare display of generosity and a usually self-serving music scene. Johnny and Noel met up by, by chance, got to talking, Noel idolised Johnny, and the outcome of the whole thing was that J Johnny didn't sell, they actually gave him his guitar. And so it was almost like passing on the mantle from one generation to the next, it was symbolic, you know, from the Smiths, I mean, there's, there was a, there was the Stone Roses in between, but really, from if you, if you think from the Smiths to the Stone Roses to Oasis, that's three generations of, of rock and roll and, and three most important groups, certainly in, in in my lifetime, since the early 80s. The Roses and the Mondays were, were quite tight together, um, simply because you know they they both took so many drugs that uh, people sort of try and punch drugs off them both, and they, they, they form a tight circle. Really. Well, um, no, in, in general, they, they, they all hated each other and kept very quiet about any record contracts or any uh, A&R people who managed to sort of bring up to Manchester, and it was, it was very, uh, very competitive. You know, may, maybe in a good way, but also in a fairly nasty way as well. I mean, Liverpool was always much more fun than Manchester in that respect. The Liverpool bands always got on and were a good laugh. You know, they could laugh together, whereas the Manchester bands were a little bit more cynical. I think people in Liverpool are much more prepared to sort of um, do things with each other. Uh, although bands are very competitive between each other, they're also much more willing to kind of help each other out. Everyone knows everybody else, and nobody see, there doesn't seem to be the backbiting that there used to be back in the 80s. Um, they used, you know, I don't know whether the Manchester scene actually developed that because they came out of the Happy Mondays, the Charlatans, all that kind of thing was happening. Factory Records, who didn't want to know really about what Oasis were doing at the time. In February 94, Oasis decamped to Liverpool to lay down several B-sides at the Pink Museum recording studio. Basically, when the first was told about them by Tony Griffiths and the real people who kept telling us about his mates, this band called Oasis, and um, met them actually when they supported the real people at the Crazy House and brought them down here because they'd booked in to do some B-sides. We have a lot of bands come over from Manchester because funnily enough, there aren't really any studios left in Manchester. So, I mean, going right back, we had the Happy Mondays come in and did all their original um, kind of tracks here that went on to become hits, they did the demos. Um, I mean, recently we've had Kermit come over, we've had um, Tom from the Inspirals. I went to see them the night before they came in here, they were supporting the real people in um, a club called the Crazy House in town. I was really impressed, you know, I thought, what a great, you know, almost rock and roll band, you know, because we hadn't seen anything like that for some time. And I um, actually recognised a couple of them. I'd worked with them a few years before, Bonehead, Tony McGuigan and Griggsy. I'd been in a band a few years earlier that I'd worked with. <sighs> the Rain, I think they were called. I, was, I remember Noel popping into the session because he knew them. Um, but Liam wasn't with them at the time. I think he came in pretty shortly after that session. Well, they, were, they were booked in for four days, and um, I think it wasn't until the third evening that they, um, I think some of the real people came down to have a listen to what they'd been doing and, and sort of told them what they were doing wasn't very good, really. But uh... The idea was to do a track called I Will Believe and Take Me Away, which was an acoustic thing. Um, 
and we were having trouble with I Will Believe. It just wasn't so it wasn't really coming together. I think we had we had four days or three days, I can't remember. But it was like we were up to the next but last day and we didn't really have anything, you know, we only had one tape. And I was like, what are we gonna do, you know? Um, so we, we thought, well, we'll take me away, I'll go down easily enough. So we just put that straight down acoustically, that one. That took about 15 minutes to do that one. That's ended up as track two on the Supersonic CD, the first single. Um, and I was thinking, well, this track, I would believe, it sounds like something from years ago, you know, like an old indie guitar pop type of thing. I wasn't really thinking that this is going to, you know, this isn't actually going to do anything for them. It didn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, but I didn't really feel as though I knew them well enough to say anything along those lines. I sort of thought, no, I'll just be the engineer, you know. So I spoke to my mate Tony from The Real People, who was mates of theirs and had come in to advise and help. I said, look, you know, this was a great rock and roll band the other night. What they're doing now just sounds like indie guitar pop from maybe five years ago. So he went and said the same thing to them. And Noel come in and said, right, try something. Try something, and it was a case of going over all the previous takes because we didn't have a spare tape to use. And it was like going out on a limb. It was like if we don't have something to give to the record company, there's going to be murder. So we were like, thought, do it. It's just erase what we've done and try something else. And Supersonic happened. It was like, it wasn't like it was actually already written. Um, Noel just went in there and said, Tony, give me a, give me this beat. He starts playing it. He starts jamming over it with his guitar, and then start bonehead E. They all banged in, it was just, and it just went on. And the song starts, and there's no actual finish in it, there's no actual changes in the, the drums or anything like that, because the drummer didn't actually know what it was a song, he was just playing this rhythm. Noel just sang words that came out of his head at the time. Um, all of them were associated with the, the few days that he'd had in Liverpool. Again, Elsa has a particular problem with flatulence, she stinks quite a bit. You know, I don't know if any other dogs are the same, but she seems particularly bad for it. They're audible, you know. Um, well, she was lying on the couch over there, and um, there was a brown stain on the couch near where the dog was lying, and Bona turned around and said, Dave, your dog's followed through. Noel sort of thought, the dog's been getting at the Alka-Seltzer in the cupboard. And that's where it came from. I mean, a lot of the lines in the song, like I say, were all related to things that were happening around at the time. I just put, I know a girl called Elsa, she's into Alka-Seltzer. And pff, that's where it came from, Elsa's backside, like, you know. Creation were ecstatic about Supersonic and decided to release it as the band's first single in April 94. Noel phoned me up about Christmas, just after Christmas, um, about a month after we'd done Supersonic, and said, do you want to come and make my album? I was like, great, yeah, nice one because it was, to be honest, it was one of the first bands I'd worked with for a long time that I actually enjoyed, you know, I really enjoyed. I thought, yeah, great sound. Well, they had the album planned, they knew what songs they wanted to use, but occasionally, as with Supersonic, Noel would come out with something new, and that had to go on the album. It happened when we were at Mono Valley, um, Slide Away came about just while he was jamming, you know, Slide Away happened and that ended up on the album. But... Um, they, they, were, they were finding their feet at the time, um, trying this, trying that. Some things they were happy with, some things they weren't. They did a few weeks at Mono Valley, and um, they weren't happy with the way some of the stuff was being mixed. So they changed the producer, and they got Earl Morrison to pull the album together. Um, some of the stuff had been recorded in Cornwall. Afterwards, some stuff that was used were demos that were done on 8-track from Mark Coyle's bedroom, or living room, whatever, in Manchester. You know, it was whatever had the... They weren't really concerned about the sound quality of the thing, particularly it was more getting the right vibe to the album, you know. By now the word was out on Oasis, and London was buzzing for their first gig at the Water Rats in King's Cross. Tremendous bars. It's one of those 
you know, gigs, every, every so often a new, they're always new groups. You get you get these buzzes all the time, this was a, a definite, this was like a roar, you know, and everybody was there. It was like, you know, that legendary 100 club gig that everybody claimed that they were at in the Sex Pistols thing in 1976. Well, people always insist that they were at the water at this place in, in, in 1994, I suppose it was. It was like December, January, it was like on the border. But, Thousands and thousands of people claim they were there, and of course yeah, the capacity is like 120 or something. So there's a lot of people lying in London at the moment, kidding either themselves or their friends. In March, Oasis stole the show again, this time on The Word, performing Supersonic. But again, that was, that was another key appearance. You know, it really just um, rammed home the point of Oasis. You know, they, they weren't just about music, they were all about Liam and his sneering and his attitude and, and the sort of... John Lennon meets John Lydon, kind of hunched, um, Dickensian demeanour that you know that Manchester are so good at. You know, Sean Ryder and Ian Brown, all these people—they've got a way, their own way of walking and talking. These kind of Mancunians. It's a good rock and roll, Rolling Stones sort of attitude. Sex Pistols, punky. It's good. Rebellious and uh, you know kicking off and yeah yeah you know we're rebelling against society and uh, the government and so on. They, they spat at what was it the MTV Awards, the Grammy Awards. But like they've just been themselves, they don't really give a f about that. They've sold loads of records, they're millionaires. Who gives a f <laughs> Liam's got a lot of attitude <laughs> and uh, attitude problem, a lot of people would say. That's exactly how I'd do it. That's how the pistols did it. Their second single, Shaker Maker, went straight into the charts at number eleven. After a last minute lyric change to avoid the threat of legal action by the Coca-Cola company because of Shaker Maker's uncanny melodic resemblance to their classic 1970s jingle. Well, Noel Gallagher has a history of um, appropriating very well-known songs and, and, and lyrics. I'd like to teach the world to sing. There was a bit they had to leave off whatever, uh, which was taken from all the young dudes, the Bowie song. Uh, I don't think Bowie was into the idea. I just think Noel, Noel is all about writing populist anthems, and if that means liberally lifting directly from a populist anthem from the past to make his song even more populist and popular and then accessible to the, the milkman and the man on the street, then so be it. He's not a snob. The Columbia Hotel, which is the rock and roll hotel, which has you know, probably been home to everybody from, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing here, everybody from, you know, the, the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band to, uh, you know, the Mothers of Invention to the Captain Beefheart and his magic band. You know, all, those, all the weirdos and drug takers and, and lunatics of rock and roll past and then these five manks turn up and they get banned from the place you know it's quite funny really you know they just couldn't take it helped by some lurid tabloid headlines definitely maybe went straight to number one in the album charts on its release in august 94 shifting 150,000 units in just days it became the fastest selling album of the 90s i don't believe the first album represented um where the songs were in Noel Gallagher's head, I think he was sort of five years ahead of that, writing songs, right, writing songs for, for maybe an old generation, but but broader, broader perspective. Um, and those were things that ganged up. I mean, it happens with any band, really. The, the first album's often the best. It's the liveliest because it's, uh, it's stuff you've been doing for ten years. It's the best of those ten years. Definitely, maybe there was that feeling that, yeah, this is brilliant rock and roll, really well executed, well produced. But is it? future isn't, isn't rock and roll about the shock of the new so that was that and I think if the, if the other papers have been honest they would have reflected that ambivalence as well but none of the papers have been honest because they were too scared that they're gonna miss out on the next exclusive or they're gonna look like they're not kind of hip to what the youngsters the youth on the street are into you know, like box. eventually the draw of London proved too strong for the Gallagher brothers as they began to tire of the perpetual media circus that never left them but the ease with which Oasis had conquered Britain proved difficult to emulate in the United States. The rigours of touring took their toll on every visit and cancellations became a regular feature. Manchester bands in general have had a bad time in the States because they're, they're very anti-performance. Um, traditionally, from right back from Buscox, New Order, Joy Division, Fall, Happy Mondays, Roses, they're anti-performance bands. They like going and doing three quarters an hour and, and sodding off and having a laugh. And, you used to see New Order, they used to leave their equipment on playing while they went off and had a drink. You know, and it never really went down very well, and Oasis are a bit like that. They're, they're more rocky than those, but they are a bit like that, and they have inherited that, and America doesn't like it. Good point, but the Beatles had 
weren't performers. I mean, the Beatles invented the idea of the band not performing. I mean, they were like the prototype. So they weren't sullen, but you know, George just stood there. Ringo was Ringo, and all that Paul and John did was going to do that thing where they shook their heads, and that was the extent of their. It was hardly kind of uh, Lindsay Kemp performance artistry, was it? I mean, so I don't think that's a problem. I don't think Pearl Jam are, are tremendous performers, are they? But they're one of the biggest bands of the of the century. They sell like 15 million. I think the what might be a problem is the Mancunian surliness. You know, I mean. There's nothing more off-putting than, than being called a twat, which is effectively what Oasis do the minute they step on American soil. I come first. I don't care. I forgot about it. I didn't know no one, no one saw me now, so I come first before any f***er, and that's my attitude, all right? Because in America, the general thing is you go, you tour, you build your way up, and you build it up slowly, and REM have taken 15 years to get where they are, you know, and Oasis tried to waltz over there with, by American standards, half a set, really. A uh, small collection of songs that... Uh, don't add up to the Beatles or a tenth of the, or a hundredth of the Beatles and it failed. Um, unsurprised, it seems so obvious now. As far back as 1994, the band were surrounded by breakup rumours after McCarroll's departure and their first troubled tour of America. I don't think they ever felt comfortable with McCarroll for some reason, don't know why. Maybe there was stuff going on behind the scenes, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of it. But I think they were happy to see the back of him. And um, you know they obviously went on to greater things with his departure. And Alan White's done good stuff. I think he's a, you know he's quite a limited drummer. Carol and Alan White seems to be a bit more kind of flexible. And it's weird, isn't it, to think that only a year ago this little four piece from Colchester reckoned they could have some of uh, Oasis action, you know? But no, it's just unthinkable now. But yeah, they beat him to number one and it just sort of came out of nowhere. Until this year's, um, you know, Farago with, with Lee and um, or, or Noel, Noel walking out of the band one day after the other. That was, you know, was overtaking war reports and kind of Bosnia coverage. I mean, it was just ludicrous. It was the first time we'd seen that kind of thing. Because all the big bands that the music press has covered over the last 10, 15, even 20 years, they've just been music press bands. They haven't been written about in the Daily Mail or. Some people haven't been chatting about them on the Clapham on the bus. I don't know what kind of fueled that remark. I know he, he doesn't particularly like Blur's music. I, mean, I don't think he knows them that well. And to really build up that amount of antipathy that he just want them to die from like a hideous, with terrible disease, you know, seems really sort of far-fetched and strange. At the end of October, Oasis' second album, What's the Story, Morning Glory, was released. It surpassed even definitely maybe, selling over 350,000 copies in a week second only to Michael Jackson's bad. Well, that was funny, actually. That was funny, it's from a critic's point of view. And uh, everyone put up on one, one journalist, as far as I tell, and I read everything, slugged it off. Oh, not as good as the first album. All over by the shouting. No songs in here. Very lazy, uninspired. Won't tell anywhere near as many as definitely, maybe. Well, what was it? 10 times platinum. Um, well, at first listen, it was a, it was kind of a, a sad album, really. What's the story? It was reflective. It was almost mournful and melancholy. It should have been the other way around because the first album was very celebratory. And oh, tonight I'm a rock and roll star. We're going to live forever. Everything's feeling super, you know, supersonic, past the fags and alcohol. Isn't this bloody marvellous? We're in a rock band. Here we go. Well, hey. Then they make it as a tremendously successful rock band. It's sort of. Don't look back in anger. Oh, well, after all, you are my wonder. And so all these kind of reflective ballads, and it's the wrong way around, isn't it? It should have been like, oh, here's the tentative first album with all these kind of slightly subdued songs, and bloody hell, they like it. Oh, here we go. You know, knees up, Mother Brown, supersonic, cigarettes and alcohol. So it was, a, it was kind of. I think that's why writers were a bit taken aback. A lot of people write songs by, oh, we've got this great guitar riff and this great arrangement and all these musicians playing this, that and the other. And then the vocalist is left to try and find his way on top of it. But Noel sings while he's writing. He'll pick up the guitar and he won't just play a few guitar chords blindly and do nothing about it. He'll be singing while he does it and there'll always be a melody. I remember uh, interviewing Noel and, and um, he was talking about um, the Beatles and the Beatles influences, and I said to him, I, I never, I never used to listen to the Beatles when I was a kid because I used to think of them as, you know, my mum and dad's era. And he said, and the only stuff I ever listened to was the, um, the two compilation LPs I had with the 
Blue Album and the, and the Red Album, which was one was from, I don't know, 67 to 70, the other one was from the earlier years. And he said, oh, that's, that's all I ever had. That's all you ever needed. It just had all the great hits on it. And it was just like that, that thing of like, this is, this is a man who's been brought up on, on, on um, very obvious reference points, obvious tunes that everyone, everyone's heard. And you could see that in the music. If you believe what you, you read, Noel just knocked off the songs in five minutes backstage at various gigs and he wrote the, the lyrics on the tablecloths. You know, because he's Mr. Prolific, or at least he was, you know, at that point. And, and also all the singles that they released in 1995 and 94, they've all got extra songs, and really good songs as well. The Master Plan, which I think is the B-side of, well, not even the B-side, one of the three extra tracks on Wonderwall. It's one of their best songs, you know, it's like Slide Away, one of those really epic ballads. He just knocks them out. Faced with the question of what to do next, Oasis simply went even bigger. Their November shows at Earl's Court were the biggest indoor gigs ever held in Europe with 38,000 fans attending over two nights. Yeah, apparently the, the earth moved around Earl's Court. You know, there was actually, they could be registered on something of Richter scale. For the media, the Brits 96 were dominated by Jarvis and Jacko and Liam and Noel, who won three awards. They delivered another searing performance and accepted their awards the only way they knew how, controversially. We all thought it's for by idiots and ponytails with dicky balls on. What about the one voted by fans, though? Uh, the one voted for by the fans means a lot. Anything that's voted for by fans is, is special. Anything that's voted for by idiots, corporate pigs, means nothing to us. Yeah, silly, wasn't it? It was daft. Yeah, but it was good TV. And it just shows you that, really, people say, oh, everything's been done. Sex Pistols on Bill Grundy, have seen it all before. It's boring, isn't it? But it's not boring, because... You know, we all saw, sat up, we all watched it, we all laughed it, and it was on the cover of the sun and the, the mirror the next day, and it just shows you what, how little you've really got to do to make people notice. All you've got to do is bend over and show your ass. It's not a lot, we've all done it, but yet again, most rock bands don't, because when rock bands make it, they feel like they kind of owe it to everybody to behave well, because they feel like they've been given money, and I don't think Oasis think like that. Without Glastonbury, Summer 96 was all about Oasis at Nebula. Oasis played to a quarter of a million people, the largest open air concert in British history. Well, I imagine all experiences in life affect you in some way. I mean, being a massive band, playing a massive gig, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna feed or destroy your ego some way. It just depends on the people who are doing it, you know. 
the most exciting thing about Nebula for me was, was just the enormity of it all. I just, to me, I, the last year and a half of Oasis's history, I've just been getting off on the size of it all. I don't, you know, it's the same song that I heard a year and a half ago. They're not going to play anything. Unless, until they start playing an entirely new set, then the, the sexiest aspect of the whole thing is the sheer vastness, the number of people that are into them, looking around, just, Jesus Christ, look at all those bloody people in this garden. It's amazing. Love to America again. Shove it up the ants. They began an ill-fated tour of America without Liam, who blamed laryngitis and housing problems for his shock airport walkout. They're so successful here. They're playing to what? Two and a quarter of a million people at Nebworth. Then they go over there and they're playing to like 200 or even 2,000, even if it was 20,000 people. It's still going to appear like a step back. And that's going to cause sort of tension in the ranks and if they don't sell out every night as apparently they didn't do at some of the, the, the recent gigs then Noel's going to probably blame Liam because Liam's not doing a good enough job and then Liam will say well it's my band I started it you only joined after you left in spirals and then you'd be nothing without me and then it would lead to that and then there'd be Liam would be away from Patsy and his house things not sorted out and Noel's missing Meg and on the other hand you know it's still going on and, but you can imagine that the inclination isn't there to finish the job because, you know, they've, they, their rise has been meteoric in Britain, and then there'll be that impatience to do the same in America. America is completely different. You've know, got to really slog your way through that country if you want to make it, and maybe they haven't got the patience to slog when they know they can come back here and be the biggest band since the Beatles. Denying a split, Liam eventually joined the band in America. Liam, what have you got to say about the rumours that the band are on the verge of breaking up? Breaking down, that's it. Breaking down, then? Yeah. Break, we're breaking down. Who's that? I heard people going, oh, it's ridiculous they're being so childish. How can they storm home and, and, and uh, have this? They're just doing it for press. Um, no. I'd, going nine tours in America, I would have gone insane on the, on the fourth or fifth. They did really well to hang on that long. <laughs> I do care about him, I just had to go out and I've got a sore throat. I love him tonight. I do you said I don't care about him. So, so it was because you were ill that you didn't come? Yeah, and I had to go and get an house. Find an house. Two things, laryngitis, nowhere to live. Some people here are saying you've got an arrogant attitude. Oh yeah, that's what makes Oasis, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. They've already made it in America. Just because it doesn't turn up for a couple of shows doesn't mean like they're going to lose it completely. I think they should be staying in Europe, not in America, because America's got their own bands, their own stuff, and I think they should be staying here. They're big enough in Britain, so, and they're big enough in the rest of the world, so why America? I just had problems at home, you know, finding out, so the sore throat, couldn't come to America, that is it, me and our kid are sweet. But you know fans I mean? the fans are upset by what you did. Yeah, but so I was upset, that's it, I'm upset the way the f***ing tour gets f***ing wrote and that, you got to go here, you got to go there, I had to find an house, simple as that. I can't come to America and go back to England, I've nowhere to live, I'm sorry, I come, I come first, I come first. You come before your Thursday, you make Yeah, of course I do, that's me, yeah. Have a to I, come, I, come, I come first, I don't care, I forgot about it, I didn't know, no one, no one sorted me else out. I come first before any f***er, and that's my attitude, alright? The fans. Any fans yeah, of course I do, of course I do. How do you justify that? That's the way it is, it's drawing attention to faults that the band maybe didn't even know they had themselves and would be better off maybe not knowing. I mean, Liam and Noel have always fought. Their brothers, the bound to have always fought. Um, but if the cameras are following you round day in, day out, and you have a fight in front of 10 million people, everyone's going to think it's something monumental. When in actual fact, it's just two brothers having a fight. You know, they are oasis when they're on stage. But the rest of the time, it's just Liam and Noel, and the other lads are the same. They're one of the few bands I've met 
where they have not changed as people. They haven't changed as people with all the stardom and all the things they're accused of and what have you. Um, they haven't changed. I still think that they're, they're pretty much the same as they were a couple of years back. They're a lot wiser, you know, but they're also under an awful lot more pressure, so it's going to be... No, you know, anything could happen, no one knows. An emotional Noel arrived back in Britain without the band after the US tour was cancelled, fueling rumours of a split. In a statement to the press, Croatian Records did not deny a split, but pointed instead to internal problems within Oasis. A lot of it was high, I mean, this split, they said Oasis split, everybody knew that that was a load of, a load, a load of old tosh, really. I mean, they've been splitting up since they were born, haven't they, those two? And, it's, and they will continue to do, and they'll split up and wall. Well, maybe that's part of the theatre, but uh, I think you have to establish yourself more on, on a global scale before, before you get accepted and before that becomes part of it. Autumn 96 saw the band in Abbey Road Studios, working on their third album, the split apparently behind them. Noel's collaboration with the Chemical Brothers went in at number one, and an unusual calm had descended over the Oasis machine. A survey was published showing that Oasis were the nation's favourite ever rock band, beating the Beatles into second place. So only two years after Noel had boasted that Oasis was going to be the biggest band in the world, it seemed that they had achieved it. They've done that, they've been living that life for two years, three years, it's all they've experienced. And there is a slight danger that it's all going to be about being on tour, being stuck in hotels in Memphis, and getting, getting drunk backstage. And it won't, it'll, I suppose, the, you know, Will the public be able to relate to it? You know, are they going to be any of those popular anthems that I don't know, we'll have to see. Just how long they will remain in such a dominant position is uncertain. But the same fans who created the success story of the 90s are far from sure where Oasis will be 20 okay. years from now. I think the impact the biggest impact has just been a sense, a, a new sense of enthusiasm, a new sense of like, if Oasis, if, if a band like that, which, which, which for a while were like just another band on the local band scene, if they can, if they can do it, make it big, you know, there's a chance there for us, there's a chance there again for these bands. But not just that, just I think there, it just seemed to have really given people a confidence again in Manchester about, about being in guitar bands. They will be as big as the Beatles and they will influence because the Beatles will then be forgotten and the technology that has changed. I mean, the poor Beatles have to record onto eight track and two tracks and stuff. So they, they will be looked upon as, as setting ground by the next generation, I presume. They won't. The next, our, our children, grandchildren, whatever, won't ever remember who Paul McCartney was, probably. But they'll remember Mel and Liam. <laughs> I don't imagine them being together in 20 years' time. Imagine Noel to be it's like one of these really, really famous and well-renowned solo artists and that's coming away on his guitar and that. I don't know about Liam. I hope they are still together. But the same as they are now, not too different. I think they'll be around for another few years yet. I don't think all this, what's happened in uh, the last month, is going to affect them. I think they'll carry on, but I don't, I, I, I don't think they'll be around in 20 years. I really don't. If they vanished tomorrow and they, the next album sort of, sort of failed and they went away, I still think there were two classic albums hanging around, which is a good thing to be. Um, it's one better than the Roses. But, you know, people always make, set great store by how influential a group was, but I think if you're influential, it just means that those are really awful, talentless people try and do what you're doing. You'd probably you know, be better off not being influential. But I think Oasis's legacy sadly may well be the, the glut of dreadful copyists that emerged in their wake. Let's hope that it isn't that. I hope it's just the, the, the great, you know, happy, sad anthems they've, they've uh, bequeathed to the late 20th century. And half of it lies in in, in, in Nogal songwriting. He's got a, a simplistic way of writing songs that um, people pick up on instantly. Um, and it, so far it hasn't become pompous. And if you can keep that, then I think it'll, I think it'll last, yeah. I don't think there'll ever be the Beatles, though. I don't, you know, there's only ever been one Beatles. That's, that's ridiculous, but... Uh, yeah, probably, I don't know, bigger than you two.
That's what makes Oasis, isn't it?